Good morning. I'll now begin the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. It is 9 a.m. Thursday, February 2nd, 2023. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Peterson? Here. Commissioner Sandy Brown, I, I believe she is trying to join us. I'll call her name in a bit. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Montesino? Here. Commissioner Hernandez? Commissioner Altet Schifrin? Here. Commissioner Alternate Quinn? Here. Commissioner Koenig? Here. Commissioner McPherson? Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Here. Commissioner Rotkin? Okay. Commissioner Eats? Here. Commissioner Alternate Pigler? Here. And you have a quorum. Thank you, Clerk. Director Preston, do we have any changes to the agenda today? We do not have any changes to the agenda, but um, we do have a handout for item 24 and a replacement page for item 30. Both of those have been posted to our website. Thank you very much. We'll now proceed with oral communications. Any member of the public may address the commission on any item within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not already on the agenda. The commission will listen to all communication, but in compliance with state law, may not take action on items that are not on the agenda. Speakers are requested to state their name clearly so that it can be accurately recorded in the minutes of the meeting, and you'll have uh, two minutes each. Go ahead, please approach the podium. Thank you. My name's Jim Helmer. I'm a lifetime uh, San Lorenzo Valley resident. Um, I have a 32 year career. Uh, most of it spent with the city of Santa Cruz as its traffic engineer, and also with the city of San Jose as the director of transportation. I'll, I'll just get right to my key point. Um, I'd like you to consider the following. Make Highway 9 from Felton to Boulder Creek wider, safer, um, through a combination of retaining walls, wider shoulders, and walkways, and particularly drainage systems. Caltrans and RTC, you've spent millions and millions of dollars on retaining walls on Highway 17 and Highway 1. None of those locations even involve pedestrians, let alone a primary walking route to school. Um, Now's the time to insert into your current contract with um, Mark Thomas and Associates. We're looking at solutions from Felton to Glen Arbor Road to, ins to incorporate, if by change order necessary, retaining walls, pedestrian, cycling, drainage improvements that lead to the 21 foot substandard, sub seismically safe bridge at Brackney Way on Highway 9. It's 96 years old built in 1927. It's got a 21-foot wide driving deck, which is the narrowest on any state highway in the county, and it serves 21,000 cars a day when Highway 9 is open. The headlines usually lead off in San Lorenzo Valley with letters RE, react, respond, repair, rebuild, review, regulate, resilience, and repeat. I would like to see a shift to more proactive proactivity in San Lorenzo Valley. And I, I did want to thank Supervisor McPherson for everything he's done to guide the RTC and Caltrans in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmer. All right, seeing no one else here in chambers that wishes to comment, is there anyone on Zoom? I will begin with Joanna Lighthill. Good morning, commissioners. Thanks for considering comments. Um, I, like many who follow these meetings, um, have been following the development of the trail plans. And I just wanted to announce that uh, the final EIR for segments eight and nine are available for viewing, public viewing on the city web website. I just discovered it last night. Um, I didn't get a chance to read it, of course. It's thir over 1,300 pages. And uh, I realized that that is more than the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Master Plan and the Master Plan's EIR combined. 
uh, quite a document. It shows us how significant the uh, potential impacts can be and, and that people are very concerned. Um, thanks to the commission for considering uh, the document. I know you guys have many hats to wear and, and it can be very time consuming. I hope that when this um, subject comes up, the, the, com the comment period will be more than the one week um, that is posted on the agenda before the meeting. So um, thank you for your consideration and, um, and, you, and all of your work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lighthill. Next up is Michael Saint. Uh, good morning, uh, Eric Koenig and Commissioners Michael uh, CFS uh, and Aptos resident. Uh, instead of criticizing the poor choice of the Oxlane's hybrid bus and traffic, let me share the benefits of a true bus on shoulder with a dedicated lane. Uh, number one, they have proven on time performance. Bus will move past cars with them. By using the existing freeway infrastructure, bus on shoulder leave has costs as little as uh, $1,500 to $100,000 per lane model to implement. The average cost of a freeway lane for cars is $2 to $10 million. A side benefit of bus on shoulder is that it will allow out of service buses that normally do not use the freeway to deadhead quickly and then do quicker turnarounds for use. Also a true bus on shoulder improves access on and off of the freeway, which can speed up passenger stop, especially for express style service. Bus on shoulder can be very quick to implement if all the parts or part of the infrastructure is available. Safety, which is always a concern. Uh, as an example, the long just running bus on shoulder uh, in the country in Twin Cities has a good safety record. Only 20 accidents with no fatalities in 10 years. It may be a challenge to motivate policymakers to allow bus on, on shoulder dedicated due to its limited use in the United States. As an advocate for mass transit and those that share these views of safe, reliable, efficient mass mode of transportation, we're hoping and advocating for an RTC that will switch its priorities from single occupancy vehicles to mass transit opportunities. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Next up is JB. Hi, um, first I just wanted to note, it seems like there's an awful echo coming from the RTC chamber. Um, I don't know if you guys can mute that microphone, but it would be good probably during public comment. Um, I'm going to mute my speaker, or actually I'm not hearing it now, so I'll go ahead and start. I just had a quick one uh, for you um, in regards to uh, the uh, Progressive Rail uh, Roaring Camp uh, request for uh, um, storing oil cars on the uh, 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 corridor uh, between mileposts three and four. Um, it was on the January agenda, agenda, was pulled at the last minute, and then uh, said it would be brought up in this meeting, but in this agenda, there is no meeting, or there is no, there is no agenda item for it. Um, so I'm just curious if, uh, if the uh, commission can uh, uh, report back on, on what is the progress of this. Did Progressive Rail completely pull this request, or if it's uh, still out there and coming up on, on a future agenda? Um, I. I've been here a while. I, I saw what happened when Iowa Pacific uh, did this sort of thing and basically left the commission powerless uh, in, uh, uh, you know, putting in 100 car requests and then having it for 200 cars um, in there. Uh, Iowa Pacific pocketing the money and then splitting town, leaving the cars behind. Um, even though this sounds like it's good intentions for uh, doing uh, biofuels uh, for the Martinez refinery, it really brings nothing to our community um, and uh, uh, is something I think we should uh, you know, put aside because we're supposed to be using that corridor for active transit or public transit and that just doesn't fit the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Next up is Mr. Nelson.
Let's try that again. I'm unmuting here. Uh, good morning. I'm Jack Nelson. I'm a retired land use planner and environmental planner. And I'm reading a book titled Ecological Footprint, Managing Our Biocapacity Budget by Mathis Wackernagel and Bert Byers. They are with the Global Footprint Network. And I thought there's a fascinating chart on page six of this book, which you can look up your year of birth and and see an estimate of how much, what proportion of all fossil fuels have ever burned and burned by human beings since you were born. So for instance, uh, my year of birth is 1951. And this table tells me that 87% of all fossil fuels that we've ever burned have been in my lifetime. So it's taken one lifespan to set up the destruction of our civilization through climate change. What is your commission doing to stop building the greenhouse gas chamber on this planet? Another little factoid I'd like to share with you, the climate scientists are telling us that the heat generated by this greenhouse effect is being absorbed at the rate of 93% of it by our Earth's oceans. So how long will the Earth's oceans continue to give us a little break? We are heating the kettle we live in. Please do not keep building the greenhouse gas chamber. Thank you. That was our last speaker on Zoom. So I'll now. I'm sorry, Commissioner. We are having an echo issue. It looks like I can't hear it. You can't hear it. So we're trying to figure out what's causing it. So just bear. All right. Thank you for that. Let us know if uh, we can help at all here on the stand. Uh, I'm here for the record, Mike Rodkin. I, uh, sorry, I uh, had trouble getting on this morning. And I hear the echo online for sure. <laughs> Seeing all the nodding heads. All right, thank you, Commissioner Rodkin. Also, I recognize uh, Commissioner Brown has joined us. San Sandy Brown has joined us as well. I will now proceed with the consent agenda. Does any commissioner wish to comment or have questions on the consent agenda? Um, Mr. Chair? Uh, I just Mr. Like McPherson. One comment uh, on item 20, uh, 21A, a letter from uh, Congresswoman Anna Eshoo about um, the uh, Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission's Boulder Creek Complete Streets project uh, had $1.5 million in it in the Consolidated Appropriations Act. And um, she worked very hard on that. Uh, it's very important to Boulder Creek and the San Lorenzo Valley uh, that that be implemented. I appreciate that. She is uh, with redistricting, not a representative of the San Lorenzo Valley, but I know the new Congressman, uh, Jimmy Panetta, is very much aware of this. We've made him, he's very much aware of this. And uh, I just want to thank her in particular for pushing this forward for the Boulder Creek community in San Rosa Valley. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Are there other questions or comments from commission members? Seeing none, does any member of the public wish to comment on the consent agenda? Anyone on Zoom? Move the consent agenda. Second. 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 Okay, we had a motion by uh, Commissioner Schiffrin, second by Commissioner McPherson. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call vote, please. So if you're not speaking, could you check to make sure your mic is off? It sounds like that might be a problem. Continue to work on that. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Hernandez? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin? Commissioner Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Pegler? Aye. Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. And that passes unanimously. Thank you.
Consent agenda being passed, we'll proceed with item 22, commissioner reports. Does any member of the commission wish to share anything? Seeing none, we'll proceed with item 23, director's report. Director Preston, take it away. Thank you, Chair Koenig. Um, are we still having the echo problem because I'm hearing it from the audience. Is somebody in the audience logged on to the Zoom call? Because that would be causing our problem. Okay. Um, I will proceed with my director's report. Um, I'm going to start with a quick announcement of a new alternate uh, commissioner appointment. At the last RTC meeting, I announced uh, several new commissioners and alternates. Uh, in addition to what was announced in January, the city of Santa Cruz has reappointed uh, council member Sandy Brown as their primary representative with Mayor Fred Keeley serving as her alternate. There are still a few more appointments forthcoming, including from Metro and an alternate for Commissioner Hernandez. Um, moving on to RTC appointments to committees as just accepted by the commission on the consent calendar, there is important information on committee appointments um, included with item number 17. With the exception of Commissioner Alex Peterson's interim appointment to the Coast Rail Coordinating Committee, uh, appointments will occur at the March RTC meeting. So if any commissioner is interested in serving on the Budget Administration and Personnel Committee, the Coast Rail Coordinating Committee or CalCOG, please contact either Chair Koenig or myself by February 15th so we can uh, be prepared for the March meeting. Um, one more thing um, that was on consent is uh, AB 361 findings. Um, uh, um, and those allow us to meet remotely during the pandemic. Uh, we are meeting here today in what has been uh, penned as the hybrid method with some commissioners here in person and some commissioners attending by video conference. With the governor's expected list lifting of the emergency orders at the end of February, it will no longer be possible for commissioners or committee members to attend by video conference unless some very restrictive circumstances are met in accordance with AB 2449. The staff report for item number 14 contains very important information regarding expectations for physical attendance at meetings starting in March. If you are seeking more details, I recommend you review the staff report and contact either um, Administrative Services Officer Yesenia Parra or myself with any further questions. RTC will continue to make both commission and committee meetings available for members of the public to attend either in person or remotely when the technology permits. And I know today it's been challenging, um, but um, I will likely have the great fortune of seeing most of you commissioners in person each month starting in March. Um, I have an announcement regarding uh, State Route 1 construction. Um, uh, earlier this week, uh, uh, the CTC approved our $72 million construction allocation for the Highway 1 Hybrid Bus on Shoulder Auxiliary Lane project between Bay Porter and State Park. This allocation is part of our $107 million SB1 grant that we received two years ago. This project will now go out for construction bids with construction starting this spring. This project is right behind the active Highway 1 construction project from Soquel Avenue to 41st Avenue, which was also partially funded by the CTC SB1 grant. Some preliminary clearing and grubbing work between Soquel and 41st Avenue has commenced, but that project is now expected to be placed in winter suspension until the spring. Uh, so both projects from uh, uh, Soquel Avenue all the way to State Park are expected to be in full construction this spring and summer. Um, uh, with regards to the public comment um, regarding the operator's proposal regarding rail cord car storage on the branch line. Um, the uh, January 12th commission meeting regular agenda had an item on it to consider a proposal for rail car storage on the Santa Cruz branch rail line. The proposal was submitted by our freight rail operator, St. Paul and Pacific Railway at the request of their contract operator, Roaring Camp Railroad. On the morning of the January 12th meeting, we received a letter from St. Paul and Pacific and a phone call from Roaring Camp that they had not reached an agreement with the biofuel plant seeking to store vegetable oil cars on 
the branch line, requesting that the item be moved from the January agenda to the February agenda. I announced this at the beginning of the meeting and the item was subsequently pulled from the January agenda. RTC has contacted both railroad operators multiple times to engage in a discussion about where an appropriate location might be to store cars, but we have not been successful in scheduling any such discussions with either of the operators. We do have a quarterly meeting set up uh, later next week. Hopefully that item can be addressed at that meeting. Um, uh, as of yesterday, St. Paul and Pacific said they may be ready in March. And we advise them of the need to engage with RTC staff in discussions as early as possible so that staff can have adequate time to make an appropriate recommendation to the commission. Staff will continue to work towards having these discussions, but it is possible that the rail storage proposal will not be pursued by the freight rail operators. And with that, that concludes my director's report. <laughs> Thank you, Director Preston. Are there questions or comments from members of the commission? I'd just like to make Professor a mistake. McPherson. I think I'm on. Um, it's, I'm very disappointed we don't have this um, a proposal or recommendation from Roaring Camp in St. Paul. I mean, this is important to people uh, in South County in particular. And um, I just hope that they do, or you can get this meeting together that uh, seemed to be online last time. And we set it for this this month, and now we have to wait another month. Uh, I think, um, I just wanna urge uh, Roran Camp and St. Paul to please uh, get together, make a, uh, a suggestion so we can make a, re our staff can get ready to make a recommendation to this commission. I think it's, it's time, let's get with it. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Other comments or questions? Commissioner Montesino. Yeah, I um, just want to thank staff for all the hard work of uh, getting all those grants. I know it'll be a relief for our commuters in South County. And also, I just want to report out staff has received the letter. My new alternative would be uh, Council Member Casey. So uh, if you haven't received, um, I'll get the clerk right. Now. Thank you. And, uh, and Edward, could you could could you repeat Edward, could you repeat your alternate? We couldn't hear it. Hear it. Yes, um, Casey. for Casey Clark. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions from board members or uh, sorry, commission members about the director's report. All right. Uh, seeing none, take it to the public. Chair recognizes Brian Peoples. Thank you, Brian Peoples from Trail Now. Hopefully I'm coming in clear. Yeah. Just want to suggest that you all really um, encourage the governor to continue to allow commissioners to call in the hybrid. You're a transportation community leadership, and that's really important. So hopefully there is a, a concerted effort by others other agencies that you could work with. It's very, very important that you all on the commission be allowed to continue to call in like this. It helps everybody's life. So I just want to encourage this agency to do that. Thank you. Mr. Peoples, do anyone else wish to comment on the director's report? Seeing none. We'll proceed with item 24, the Caltrans report. Mr. Eats, are you have the honor right. of uh, hearing from you? All right, thank you. Okay, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. I will, um, at some point here, I'll probably turn my volume down. So if somebody cannot hear me, please start waving or something because it's I'm getting a ton of feedback. So um, hold on, I'm gonna turn my volume down. Please give me a visual signal if uh, if you can't hear me. All right, so I wanted to touch on a few things, uh, a couple of grant opportunities. First, the Caltrans Sustainable Transportation Planning Grants. Um, we've mentioned this before, there's nearly $85 million statewide in three grant categories. There's three workshops coming up. Uh, the first is, and these are all hosted by Caltrans headquarters. The first is Monday, February 16th from 1 p.m. to 2.30. And, and the second is Wednesday, February 8th from 1230 to two. 
and then Thursday, February 9th from 1 p.m. to 2.30. Um, please follow up with me if you're interested in gaining access. There's a, um, you can go to the, the Caltrans website, um, but you still need to ask to be given permission to attend the workshop. So please follow up with me and I'll make sure you have the correct information on that. And then those applications are due on five uh, by 5 p.m. on March 9th this year, and they'll be submitted through a Smartsheet portal. So please follow up with me if you have any questions on that. Second grant category I wanted to highlight is the Clean California Local Grant Program. Call for Projects is coming on, on February 14th. And this is the second round for this grant category. Um, it's focused on local streets and roads. Um, and targeted towards underserved communities. And it's focused on um, cleaning up and beautifying public spaces. And applicants can include local and regional um, public agencies, transit agencies, tribal governments, and nonprofit organizations. So um, there's information online. It can be found at the Clean California website. Um, and you can certainly follow up with me for more information as well. And then the application deadline on that, it will be April 28th. And then I wanted to provide an overview just on storm damage and road closures. So I have quite a bit here. I'll run through these. Um, if unless you're getting so much feedback that it's too disruptive for me to continue. Okay, it looks like we're okay. All right, so um, Highway 9, we still have a full closure between Lower Glen Ar Arbor Road and Holiday Lane. It's due to a slide. Our crews are working to clear the debris and repair the damages caused by the slide. We have an estimated date for reopening. And uh, we're also working to install a temporary signal, which will allow for one-way reversing traffic control um, beginning late next week. Um, that'll be the, the opening, um, but we're doing everything we can to get that open as quickly as we can. Um, we're expecting that the repair itself will take approximately six weeks. Second location is on Jane. Uh, hold on here, I'm getting feedback again. Um, near Jane's Timberlake Resort, this is again on Highway 9, approximately um, half a mile south of Glen Arbor Road. Um, it's been reopened to one way reversing traffic control via a temporary signal. And then the third location is about 1.8 miles north of the upper intersection of Route 9 with 236. Uh, we have a tension crack that's opened along the shoulder, and we have it open to two-way traffic with K-Rail um, present along the roadway, and we're working on a, a wall solution at that location. Okay, moving to Route 35, we have a slip out about three miles north of State Route 17. We have one-way traffic control at that location. Uh, construction may be required for repairs. We don't have an estimated time of opening for those at this point in time, but we're working on that location. Moving to 236, there's a couple of locations and there's settlement of a lane um, at two different locations. Um, the route remains closed between Little Basin and State Park entrance. Um, and then the second location is embankment and pavement settlement on the outside edge um, near Via Raton and State Route 9. We have one re reversing traffic control at that location. And then finally, the last thing I wanted to announce is you may have seen that the California Transportation Commission allocated funds at the January CTC meeting for um, the Route 9 um, pedestrian and safety improvement project um, between Felton and uh, it's in near Felton on Kirby Street to Fall Creek Drive. It's a shot funded project and it's not construction. So just to um, just to um, clarify what's happening there, it was for the right of way and design phase of the project. And so that allows us to go ahead and, and move into that next phase of development. We're still looking at a construction begin date of spring 2025. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Eads. Are there comments or questions from commissioners? Commissioner McPherson. Excuse me. I just wanted to say in general, thank you to Caltrans for its attention. As you know, in the San Lorenzo Valley, uh, we, we got hammered like everybody else in these uh, atmospheric storms. And there's uh, been really some difficulty between state and county routes for people to get around or even get into town. Um, so I just want to thank you. Uh, I know it's... Uh, 
it's a tough haul and it's going to take some time, but um, I think uh, your ability to get to it as quickly as possibly uh, possible to open one lane at least. Uh, same goes with the county uh, for Bear Creek Road. Um, thank you for your immediate attention on those. It's just critical of the people of the San Lorenzo Valley. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Any other comments or questions from commissioners? Seeing none, does any member of the public wish to uh, comment on the Caltrans report? Um, regarding the uh, California Transportation Commission funding of that section of Highway 9, <clears throat> in the report it indicated there's consideration for a non-intersection mid-block pedestrian flashing light beacon on Highway 9 from the west side to the east side, which would then um, allow students or other pedestrians to walk into Felton on the east side of Highway 9. I would highly recommend not doing this, uh, putting in a pedestrian flashing beacon in a non-controlled location will lead to major issues. Highway 9 on the east side has blind driveways, steep driveways, no walking room. Pedestrians have to walk through the Cornerstone gas station to reach the signal light. And since most of the pedestrians and students living in Felton live on the west side of Highway 9 all through town, to send them on the east side would be requiring them to cross two times across the signalized intersections in various unsafe corners and mid block islands or mid intersection islands. So I would highly recommend to make all of the improvements on the west side and to consider lane narrowing from 12 feet to 11 feet along the retaining walls, which is perfectly legal to do with a minor exception to Caltrans standards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmer. All right, any other member of the public wish to comment? Seeing none. Uh, thank you, Mr. Eads, for the report. We'll now proceed with item 25, which is a storm damage to transportation facilities in Santa Cruz County report. And uh, Ms. Christensen, I see you in the hot seat. Are you the one giving this report or will it be Deputy Director Mendez? It'll be a, ta a tag team. So okay. I'll, I'll, I'll start it off and then uh, 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 Ms. Christensen will, will do the big finish. Oh. So as you as you know, the uh, uh, pretty much almost the entire state of California, including Santa Cruz County, was hit by severe storms this winter uh, in the form of atmospheric rivers, and there's been lots of damage and um, uh, to the transportation facilities in Santa Cruz County. And state of emergencies have been declared by the governor and uh, and the president. Uh, we do have a list in attachment one of uh, some of the damage that uh, has been. Um, uh, done at transportation facilities. The initial uh, estimates for some of that damage are uh, at $50 million, exceed $50 million, but that's as of uh, the middle of last week, uh, the information we had at that time. And so uh, public agencies, uh, local jurisdictions, and the RTC, we were all still working to, to access and assess uh, a lot of the damage that was done by the storms. So it is likely that that figure will be significantly higher than that. Um, so in local jurisdictions and in, in, in public agencies, including the RTC, are already working with the county office of uh, recovery uh, and resilient response, recovery and resiliency, and the California Office of Emergency Services and uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency to be able to um, submit for financial assistance to cover uh, the cost of um, both cleanup and repair of the, the storm damage. Uh, it is uh, likely that you know, we will not get 100% of, um, of costs uh, recovered, but we get, um, uh, it, it's likely that most of the costs uh, will be recovered. Now, the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line did suffer uh, damage as well uh, in the form of uh, fallen trees, weakened trees, uh, slope slides onto the right of way, and at least one railroad. Uh, bridge that was damaged by a large tree that fell on it. That's this is the the bridge that uh, the, the railroad over the road that goes into to, uh, the entrance road to um, uh, New Brighton State Park. Um, uh, we still don't uh, are not fully aware of, of, of 
the cost of all, all the damage that that's been suffered. Uh, and when we and staff did um, uh, have an estimate uh, on the staff report about one and a half to three million dollars. Again, based on what we knew uh, in the middle of last week uh, without full inspections yet. And there have been further inspections that have uncovered additional damage that we were not yet aware of last week. And so Ms. Christensen, when she does a report, will provide information on some of that. Now, during the storms, uh, staff and contractors also responded to address fallen trees that caused damage uh, to neighboring properties and needed uh, immediate attention to, to be removed. And in order to do that, the executive director authorized uh, initial contract change order with our existing tree contractor for $14,700 and also contacted uh, the RC chair, Chair Ma Koenig, uh, for authorization of an additional 50000 to be able to address that, that work. And with those funds, staff has been working to, to remove uh, uh, the trees that needed most immediate attention. However, more funds are going to be necessary to be able to not only remove trees, but also clean up debris and do uh, uh, regrading of drainage dish ditches and so on. Uh, but that is not for repair of any damages. The the, the cost for repair damages will be quite uh, quite beyond that, and we will likely have to come back to the commission as we know more uh, and um, get your authorization to to be able to uh, uh, have the funds available for some of those damages and and. Um, and Ms. Christensen will also report more on some of the potential ways that we might have, have to use to address uh, repair those damages. Um, now we do estimate that at this time, $400,000 uh, is, is what is needed to be able to address uh, the additional tree uh, removal that we must do, as well as uh, debris removal and uh, the drainage ditch uh, regrading. So staff does uh, recommend that the OHC approve the attached resolution authorizing the executive director to enter um, into amendments or make amendments or enter into existing contracts um, or new contracts as necessary to address uh, storm damages, uh, including the removal of the trees that were damaged or, or weakened or, or knocked down by the storms and the removal of debris and, and the regrading of ditches. Um, for uh, um, a maximum amount of four hundred thousand dollars, and this uh, RTC does have sufficient funds in its in its budget for railway right of way maintenance to be able to cover this amount, in addition to its already existing uh, commitments uh, for the for those funds. And as I mentioned before, staff is already working with uh, Cal OES and FEMA to be able to uh, obtain reimbursement uh, for uh, RTC costs. Um, and uh, with that, I'll pass it over to uh, uh, your senior engineer, Christensen, to provide more information. Thank you, Luis. Um, I have Brian on the line, who's going to be pulling up a PowerPoint. Um, and as Luis mentioned, uh, we have completed more inspections since last week's staff report was released. And I just wanted to give you a more comprehensive update to the Santa Cruz branch rail line uh, storm damage that we. Sustain. So, Brian, if you could pull up the PowerPoint. We, we see it. Okay, can we go to the next slide? All right, so I'm gonna talk real quick about that damage bridge that Luis mentioned um, at New Brighton State Beach. The fallen trees give a summary. Um, landslides that uh, are quite common in, in major storm conditions on the branch line. We've had a few slope embankment failures, also known as washouts, not full washouts, but partial washouts of the um, slope embankment that require immediate attention. And then the Manresa Coastal Bluff um, has been weathered quite a bit and um, needs additional attention as well. And then we'll have um, time for questions and discussion. Next slide. So the, um, there was a large eucalyptus tree that fell on the New Brighton State Beach Bridge. Uh, it's at milepost 14.85. This bridge is a... Um, short single span bridge that goes over the driveway into New Brighton State Beach. 
the bridge uh, broke off a piece of the reinforced concrete walkway and damaged the cable railing. Next slide. We had 40 trees fall um, throughout the 32 mile branch line. Um, this was um, some were more critical than others and we are responding accordingly. So we are um, tackling them by, um, you know, how critical they are. For example, if they're blocking um, a roadway or uh, encroaching into a private property, we're addressing those first and then um, chipping away at it through our uh, contract with our existing tree contractor who's been really great with responding to these um, emergencies. Next slide. Here's just a couple highlights of um, fallen trees. You can't walk very far on the branch line without running into one. Uh, next slide. We also had 20 landslides along the branch line. These um, are quite common during storm conditions when um, the slopes become saturated with uh, the rainwater and then um, they kind of slough off. And it's usually when the rail line's in a cut location with side slopes that go up um, alongside the rail line. And um, what happens is the, the debris that comes down the slope clogs the drainage uh, system and causes additional problems if not addressed. And then it leaves a bare slope uh, that requires some uh, erosion control type of measures to be placed. And so um, these repairs look like a debris removal and then um, putting on erosion control fabric with anchors to um, restabilize that slope. Next slide. So here's an example um, where, you know, you could see the bare slope um, that needs to be, you know, addressed with erosion control measures and then all of that debris in the ditch. So next slide. So now onto the more critical repairs that are needed um, due to the recent storms. We had um, a slope embankment failure just south of New Brighton along the branch line at milepost 14.7. This um, requires immediate attention and we are um, planning to issue an emergency contract to address this location as well as the second location on the screen, which is milepost 8.5, just south of Manresa State Beach. Um, the photo on the right doesn't really do much justice um, in showing what really is going on here. So we had about a, a very, very large tree, about four or five foot diameter tree that fell and that tree was located um, maybe five feet from the drainage cross culvert outlet. And what happened was when that giant tree fell, it took the culvert headwall with it. It pulled it out and disconnected it from the drainage pipe. And so now we have um, our cross culvert headwall is disconnected and we've got quite a mess on our hands to clean up. And then also um, because of all of the erosion and heavy flow of um, drainage through this area, it has resulted in a critical slope embankment failure that needs to be addressed immediately. So um, this is this was not um, known at the time of the staff report. Um, I think we were out in the field when the um, <laughs> packet was being posted. So um, this is the this is the biggest repair that we're aware of at this point. Um, and we are planning to address it as an emergency because it does, um, you know, if you have a failed culvert and heavy flows are going through it, it's going to cause additional damage. So next slide. I mentioned the Manresa Coastal Bluff. We've been chipping away at maintenance projects up here at the Coastal Bluff to try to slow down the um, erosion and um, address some drainage issues up there. So we recently completed a maintenance project that included placing plastic cover. So you see the left, the picture on the left um, is the most critical location that we're working um, on repairing. And that plastic cover 
um, is kind of a band-aid, a short-term band-aid for, you know, stopping the erosion. Well, that plastic cover that we just replaced was torn and um, needs to be replaced again because of the heavy winds and rain. Um, and so uh, the project also included dr uh, drainage ditch regrading on the inland side of the tracks. And that was to reestablish the drainage system on the inland side and um, kind of more of a preventative maintenance um, effort. And uh, that drainage ditch is right next to a, a very steep slope embankment and that slope embankment failed and a bunch of debris came into the, our brand new ditch. So we have to get back out there and um, kind of fix up the work that was already done. Um, additionally, we've been working on a culvert rehab project just north of um, this erosion location near uh, Manresa State Beach. And the sinkhole that we've um, we've reported to the commission previously, that sinkhole opened up and now it's just a big giant hole that we've barricaded off. So we're, um, we're gonna be starting that rehabilitation project very soon. We're meeting with the contractor. And so we're, luckily we have a contractor on board that they, they could address that as part of that project. Um, and finally, we had some um, additional um, failures and erosion at that existing retaining wall um, along the branch line at the top of the bluff. So you could see that um, retaining wall failure, the picture on the very right and the picture on the bottom are the same failure, but it's two different views. So you could see the, you know, um, the embankment uh, slipped out underneath the wall. Next slide. So our recommendation at this point, um, no additional action is needed today, um, but we're gonna continue to assess the branch line storm damage. We're going to issue a task order with our on-call civil and structural engineering consultant to develop the plans and specs for this railing and walkway replacement um, or repair at a New Brighton State Park um, Bridge. We're gonna continue removing the 40 um, fallen trees under our existing contracts. We're also gonna be procuring an arborist um, to assess and remove additional trees as needed. And we do this periodically um, to address, you know, um, tree risk and determine if we need to remove trees that haven't fallen yet. For the landslides, we're in the process of developing a scope of work for the debris removal and erosion control measures uh, to address the 20 landslides. Um, we are planning to issue an emergency contract due to the critical nature of reestablishing the drainage system. So that um, is uh, forthcoming. And then for the slope embankment failures, we plan to issue emergency contract to address the slope embankment failures for those two critical uh, washout locations. And just um, to explain how emergency contracts are a little bit different. So um, the RTC procurement policy allows the executive director to enter into emergency contracts um, as needed to prevent obviously future um, damage and, and continued problems for the RTC. And then um, the way that it works is he, you know, we identify the emergency, he contacts the chair of the commission, um, and then we report back at the subsequent um, RTC meeting um, the details of that emergency contract. So um, just a side note there. And then the Manresa Coastal Bluff, um, we're planning to issue a contract change order for the maintenance project that we just completed to um, address the debris removal and the plastic cover. And then we're gonna continue working on um, that slope uh, stabilization and, and continue our work up at the Manresa Coastal Bluff that needs attention. That concludes my presentation. I'm here for questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Senior Engineer Christensen and Deputy Director Mendez. Thank you for those pictures. They were very helpful. All right, comments or questions from commissioners? The chair recognizes uh, Commissioner Rockin. Thanks, thanks, Manu. Um, on a number of the still uh, unmute, Mike, which is I thought you I seem unmuted. to be unmute. I'm unmuted. I think well, we can't hear you at least here in chambers. Wonder what's going on. Uh, uh, oh, how about, how gotcha. about now? Can you hear me now? Go ahead. Okay. Sorry.
um, a number of these um, hillsides have slid down. Uh, I was talking to, to Sarah Christensen. The, the um, typical way of responding to these is um, some kind of like a, I don't know, a, 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 a cover of some sort, you know, on a hillside to stop it from sliding further. But some of these are vertical. And I'm wondering whether you, any kind of anything short of a retaining wall would stop it, would, would make any difference. Oh, so you, you cut so you cut back the slope uh, so it's no longer vertical before you put something on top of it. Thank you. Uh, my question was just uh, when do they plan to do some of those repairs? Because we got some more scheduled rains coming in this week. Uh, just wondering if it's going to, you know, have more continued damage to some of the erosions. Uh, but yeah, I just wonder when the, when the, when they plan to, uh, do some of those repairs. Uh, hear the, I hear the echo. Tree issues through existing contracts. We are preparing a scope of work for the landslides and that, I anticipate in the next week or two, our staff will have a scope of work ready. And then what we do is we contract, we contact contractors. What's challenging for the RTC is that a lot of times we need contractors with track mounted equipment. Those are not, um, you know, there's not a ton of them out there. They're not local. We have to um, reach far and wide to get interest and try to get these contractors to Santa Cruz and, um, you know, enter into contracts with us. So it could take, you know, a month before we actually break ground, but the breaking ground part also is weather dependent. So we're going to get to it as fast as we can, but you're right. I mean, the longer we let these sites um, stay out there, the more challenging the repair is going to be and the more damage potential. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. Other comments or questions from commissioners? We've got just a couple of questions. Um, the first was we saw in um, some of the news media reporting that there was also damage to segment seven, phase two, uh, the construction that the city is undertaking right now. Is that um, any further information about that? We've been working with city public work staff, and um, we are aware that there has been some damage, but we are still working with them on understanding the full extent of that. The city's engineer, Josh Spanger, is also available if you have additional questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Spanger. Did you want to add anything to that? Okay. Never mind. Um, the second question was uh, regarding the emergency. Oh. Not chair, chair Koenig, members of the commission, can you hear me now? We can, thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, we, we suffered quite a bit of damage on that section due to erosion from uh, uh, drainage uh, above the slope. So this is just below Bay Street on in the city of Santa Cruz from California heading uh, down towards the boardwalk. Uh, it, a lot of the a lot of the damage occurred because of drainage systems that. Uh, are not associated with the project actually, but are come from housing developments uh, above the project. And we would have seen that kind of erosion uh, regardless of whatever kind of construction activities was happening. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we lost all of our grades and we, you know, suffered a great deal of, uh, of mud uh, on the, we lost all of our survey, we lost all of our grades. And so it's, it set us back and, and uh, the estimate 
right now might be a bit too generous, but it's better to, in our estimation, estimate a little bit larger now and then winnow it down once we get a better uh, sense of the damage. And I saw some initial estimates north of a million dollars. Is that? That's still? correct. All right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Spangard. You're welcome. And then uh, the other question was uh, regarding some of the emergency tree work uh, that I authorized the executive director to enter into. Um, I believe some of that work was uh, in response to trees that fell along Depot Hill and uh, that some of those trees may have fallen on homes. Do we have any liability there that we expect to have to resolve? Um. We do work with with our uh, liability insurance for for some of these things when damage uh, occurs to neighboring properties. And our liability insurance uh, carrier has told us that that typically for acts of God as, as this, each property owner basically uses their own insurance to to cover their own damages. That's normally how how it's handled. Um, and we certainly have have talked to some neighboring property owners who have been concerned about that damage to the property and communicated that that's typically how our, how insurance uh, companies tend to look at it. However, um, they still are able to uh, you know, whatever um, cost they incur to to deal with any any damage to their property, uh, they can submit a claim to the RTC uh, and we will submit it to our insurance company for evaluation. Okay, thank you, Deputy Director Mendez. I see no other comments or questions from commissioners. I'll open it to the public. Actually, just a quick question. Oh, sorry, yes, Commissioner Rodkin, go ahead. Sorry, thanks. Um, just so we don't set up a bunch of unreasonable expectations, people understand that submitting a claim to the RTC doesn't mean that we're necessarily accepting that we are responsible. And I think the earlier comment um, from our staff that that um, and that Madam Mono made this comment as well, that um, when when there's a, a, say a tree falls that had been on our property and falls onto a private property, it's not necessarily the case that we're liable for that. And it cuts both ways. If somebody above us uh, is responsible for a washout that comes down a hill from their property, they don't not, we don't necessarily get to blame them for it and claim it either. So I, I, people should just understand that we'll we're will, we in, willing and encourage people to submit claims, but we're not saying that it's submitting that means it's going to get paid. It really will come down to what the legal requirements are, I think. And it's important for people to understand that. Commissioner Rockin. Uh, yeah. Commissioner Peterson. Thank you. Um, I was just curious about the uh, rail mounted equipment. Uh, you're talking about hiring specialized contractors. Mm -hmm. If it would be possible to consider purchasing some of this specialized equipment by the RTC so that we could provide just average contractors the ability um, to do some maintenance and repair along the rail line moving forward. That would make sense. I think about this all the time. <laughs> um, that would be a big undertaking for the RTC because um, not to say it's impossible, but um, we contract this work out because um, it's not just the equipment itself, but it's the operation of the equipment mm -hmm. that requires specialized training and um, skill that uh, staff doesn't have <laughs> currently. Uh, so that's why we tend to contract everything out because we're you know we're a regional transportation planning agency who happens to own a branch line. And um, we don't have like a maintenance crew like the county or the, you know, all the cities. Um, not to say that that can't be in our future, but that's that's kind of our current approach with maintenance. And I will say um, the damage just being, I've been with RTC a little over five years now, if you could believe that. Um, we established a preventative maintenance program in 2018 and the damage this time around was way less than the 2017 storms because of that preventative approach. We periodically clean our, you know, clear our culverts, hire contractors to clear the culverts, ditch, uh, re-ditch the ditches and establish a drainage system. And we're taking more of a proactive approach instead of a reactive approach. Um, and just want to say thank you to all of our staff who's been in the field the last two weeks, Riley, Brian, um, Jason Thompson. Um, so anyway, did that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Peterson. All right, seeing no other uh, commissioners with comments or questions, I'll take it out to the public. Chair recognizes Brian Peebles. 
Hi, I'm going to turn off my speaker if that helps with the echo. Um, so a couple things real quick. Um, you know, we have those historical trestles, and we'd encourage you to look at the dangerous eucalyptus trees that may fall. So maybe do some preventive me measures of, hey, that tree could take out our historical. That's something to look at. Um, one of the difficult things with repairing, obviously, that you just spoke about is the tracks are there and you have to have special equipment. And so um, it would be ideal if we start using that property as a trail and which would allow our community or the agency to go and make these repairs with standard uh, equipment because that's really preventing us. And when you look at um, preventive maintenance on a property, it's accessing that property frequently, looking at the culverts, making sure it, the debris isn't building up. As Kristen mentioned in Manresa, that tree fell. If we had seen it earlier, uh, before the washout was created, maybe we could have done something and saved ourselves some money. So we really want to encourage you to start looking at um, opening the corridor from Watson, all the way from Watsonville um, through Santa Cruz to allow us to start uh, preventing these major uh, disasters because we know we're gonna see more. We're gonna see more with climate change. And then finally, um, the segment seven erosion. You know, when you, when you do major construction and excavation like you're doing, um, those bad things happen. And so we wanna really encourage you to not do such major excavations you know, tearing out trees, destroying trees. Let's see how we can build that trail without that major excavation because we're seeing what happened. You got another million dollars. You got a 10% increase in your cost for that project. And those type of things happen. So again, I wanna uh, encourage those mitigations. Thank you. Oh, hello. Uh, this is uh, Jack Brown from uh, Aptos. Uh, one, I just wanted to say, I think the uh, echo is happening from uh, 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 Chairman uh, Koenig's microphone when the, the public speaks remotely. Um, but it looks like you're getting a handle on that, but I just want to bring that up. Uh, thank you, Sarah Christensen, for another outstanding presentation to the RTC. I always appreciate those. Um, I'm hoping this one uh, gets published on the uh, RTC site as well. Um, one of the things that should be noted is this is now happening like every five or six years uh, with, you know, the effects of climate change. So we're getting more severe storms and uh, to consider the, uh, the corridor, uh, the coastal corridor is, as a, uh, a major thoroughfare uh, through the city or through the county is uh, uh, something we need to take to heart here. Um, the repairs being hindered by having rail equipment, as Sarah and, and Brian Peebles just noted, um, really is an opportunity for us to look at what we should be doing all along here is rail banking and removing those tracks so that we can get standard equipment in to make these repairs quickly. Um, and once, because uh, these, these rails are unfit anyways for commuter rail, if ultimately through the millions of dollars we're gonna do in studies, and an additional tax measure on the ballot sometime in the future, uh, we decide we want commuter rail, we'll put in the right things at that time. But right now we need to open the corridor and make it so that it's easily repairable. Remember, trains don't swerve. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. This is uh, Michael Saint. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the presentation. Um, I wanted to follow up on what you mentioned about uh, damage in 2017. I was wondering uh, on this present damage, if there's uh, any federal funds uh, that may come forward to help us fix these areas. Um, and what is the history on 2017 damage? Has the federal government uh, funded anything to be damaged or to be fixed from the damage uh, five, six years ago. Thank you.
Mana, you may be muted if you're talking to us. We have one more comment from the public here in chambers. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, I'm Matt Farrell, and I uh, am currently the chair of Friends of the Rail and Trail. And we want to thank staff for their proactive work on addressing the storm damage on the Santa Cruz branch line and throughout the county, because I think we need to protect all the transportation assets in our community. And the branch line is one of those assets. And lastly, I just want to say that in 2016 and last June in 2023, 2022, excuse me, the voters decisively supported preservation of the rail line. So the mission and the mandate is clear. And I want to thank staff and the commission for moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farrow. I'll now return it to the commission for discussion and action. And the chair recognizes uh, Commissioner Schiffer. I have a question about what the staff recommendation is. There was a staff recommendation in our packet, and then in the presentation, it seemed to be expanded upon. Is the proposed staff recommendation a combination of those two um, pieces of information? I think the staff recommendation stands at um, what was in the packet, the four hundred thousand dollar authorization. But more more information is going to be forthcoming. Um, and I don't. I thought there was a slide that had a staff recommendation for the various components of the repairs that are needed. Those those are our recommendation, our recommended course of action, but it doesn't require any action, additional action by the commission. Okay. So I have already have authority to enter into emergency contracts. We're giving you a little bit of a heads up that and you know that's gonna be the direction that I'm moving in. The only uh, uh, action that re is required was stated in the staff report, and that was to enter into four hundred thousand dollars worth of um, uh, contracts um, uh, to get things started. I just asked a question to clarify uh, what motion I should make to support the staff recommendation. Understood. So, I, I was wondering myself. So, second. All right, motion by Commissioner Schifrin and a second by uh, Commissioner McPherson for the staff recommendation to accept the information presented today and approve $400,000 in repairs. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Montesino? Yes. yes. Commissioner Hernandez? Aye. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. Commission Alternate Pegler? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, well, now proceed with item uh, 26, which is the 2023 state and federal legislative programs. The present presentation by senior transportation planner, Rachel Morricone. Good morning, commissioners. Rachel Morricone of your staff. Before you today is our uh, proposed 2023 legislative platform for both um, state and federal legislative proposals, but also administrative proposals. The Regional Transportation Commission prepares this um, list of issues and positions on um, different issues to allow staff to react quickly when legislative proposals are put forward um, at the state and federal level, or if um, state and federal agencies have put out um, notices of rule changes or other administrative actions, which we might want to provide input on. All of the um, legislative platform is consistent with um, advanced goals and priorities that have been identified through an extensive public process through our regional transportation plan. Um, we see these as more specific actions and priorities that uh, we would anticipate coming forward either in the legislative platform or um, our realm or through uh, other activities. 
We work with our Regional Transportation Commission advisory committees um, and partner agencies throughout the state to identify priorities for the next fiscal year and calendar year. Um, and that includes agencies like the California Council of Governments, the Self-Help Counties Coalition, um, the California Special Districts Association, um, and other organizations that the Regional Transportation Commission participates as a, a member of. Some of the issues in 2023 that we anticipate coming up are, as discussed earlier in the meeting, um, modifications to the Brown Act, both the California Special Districts Association, um, CalCOG, the League of Cities, and several other organizations in the state have already um, started writing some bills there. I don't think they've secured an author quite yet. Um, they have a few more days to do that. Um, but we do anticipate that there'll be proposals that at the minimum would allow our advisory committee members to attend meetings remotely. Um, we see this as a, a critical way to in, engage the community in the decision making process. Um, the other thing is to, at a very minimum, modify. Um, uh, 361 so that uh, we can do the updates on notices of hybrid meetings at least um, every 45 days rather than just every 30 days. Some other issues that we'll be following closely and providing input on throughout the year um, relate to implementation of the Federal Infrastructure Act, um, both at the state and federal level, um, supporting uh, federal actions to ensure full funding of that program through the federal appropriations process. Um, and then providing input on proposals such as AB um, 6 and 7 that would potentially impact how regions spend funds that we have discretion over, including our sales tax measure funding. And so um, as folks know, Measure D was approved by voters in 2016 um, and has an expenditure plan that was well vetted and built through extensive community um, input and engagement. And we do have concerns that um, any proposals at the state level that might impact our ability to implement the projects that were identified as priorities for the community um, would be an issue. Um, on the state budget earlier uh, last month, the governor released his preliminary proposal for the fiscal year 23-24 state budget. Um, some of that would impact how much money becomes available, um, including some new uh, transit funds that would flow through the Regional Transportation Commission through the Transit Inner City Rail Program. Um, as you folks might remember, last year the state was facing an unprecedented surplus. It was an exciting time. Um, there was a lot of commitments, um, you know, tripling funding for the active transportation program, boosting funding for transit, zero emission vehicle programs. Um, with the latest revenue forecast, the governor is recommending to scale back some of those commitments. Um, and as staff, we recommend that the commission advocate that there is a continued commitment to the active transportation program and transit programs especially to make sure that that boosted funding is there to address the massive backlog of needs um, both on the transit bike and pedestrian um, fronts. Some additional information about some of the governor's proposals are included in the staff report. Um, I won't go into detail on all of those. I also wanted to just report, and though it also has been mentioned several times today on some of the recent federal activities, um, you know, with the Federal Infrastructure Act, there was some more flexibility on uh, boosting funding for competitive programs such as the mega program and rural programs in the state, which led to us being able to apply for and secure $30 million for Highway 1 and Metro buses um, as part of the Freedom to State Park Auxiliary Lane projects, as earlier mentioned by um, Commissioner McPherson. Uh, Congresswoman Eshoo also secured um, funding for Boulder Creek sidewalk projects through the congressional directed funding program. Um, you know, the return of earmarks um, has been helpful to address projects that just would have a hard time getting implemented without that boost of special funding. Um, on the federal level, we're also closely tracking the debt ceiling conversations and what that could do to impact um, transportation commission 
uh, transportation commitments that were set forth in the IIJA. Um, in the staff report, there's also a summary of a few of the many, many bills that were approved last year um, that we have been tracking and, and we'll be looking at implement how those are implemented. Um, for next steps, staff's going to continue to monitor bills throughout the year and legislative activities. If there are specific bills that commissioners or members of the community would like RTC staff to review, feel free to email those to our executive director and we'll, we'll dive deeper into um, what, what the impact of those bills might be on local transportation projects and priorities. So with that, I'm happy to answer some questions on page um, 219 of the PDF or 26.7 of the um, packet is the focus areas for 2023 on the state level and on uh, page 200 and I'm trying to think what it was. 227 of the PDF has the federal legislative program. But with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions and just want to recognize one of our newer planners, Matt Schroeder, for his work on this um, report as well. Thank you, Senior, senior Planner Laura Coney uh, and uh, new planner, uh, Mr. Schroeder as well. Good questions or comments? Yeah, I just want to thank you, especially uh, a year ago, we had better high hopes than we do today. And thank you for adjusting. And I just want to point out, as you have too, the, the, the Clean Streets program up in uh, Boulder Creek, but also our cooperative effort with Metro has really paid off. I mean, we have two electric buses now. We're going to have four. Our, we, we hope to get to 30 in the near future, but uh, budget-wise, who knows when that will come. But uh, just to let the general public know that we're, we're really moving ahead in, in the RTC as well as Metro and the transportation and climate programs in general to uh, seek as many uh, grants as we can from the state and federal levels and you're just right at the top of the list of of getting there when the, the money arrives so thank you for your efforts and uh, uh, we're not going as quickly as we wanted to but uh, we're moving ahead and that's really something to say in itself uh, this day and age with the budget cuts that we're going to be seeing I think it's nine point or 2.7 billion in the state uh, we, we've uh, we're holding our own and thank you very much for your efforts Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Commissioner Schifrin. Now, I also want to thank staff for all their work, uh, not only in terms of uh, keeping us informed about the legislative situation, but for being so successful in uh, um, um, obtaining the various grants. We met with a county director of community development yesterday, and we talked about all the grants that have been coming into the county, both through RTC and through the county and through the cities. And one of the points that he made about why we've been so successful is the collaboration that exists between the various agencies. And it sort of really brings to mind and uh, we sort of builds on what uh, Commissioner McPherson said, working with the transit district, the RTC, the county and the cities, um, this is a, an era of real cooperation between the agencies doing these multi-agency projects, the rail trail, rail planning, highway projects, um, and projects up in the valley that really represent the ability of the agencies to work together. We've gotten used to it, but it doesn't exist everywhere and it isn't necessarily easy to obtain. So I think uh, thanking staff for the kind of spirit that they bring to this effort. And I think we are, you know, we're reaping the success of that. I do want to just add that uh, Caltrans District 5 staff has been instrumental in helping us advance some of the Highway 9 and Highway 1 projects as well. So happy to thank them as well. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Sheffern. Commissioner Rockin. I want to echo the comments of my colleagues, um, but I want to give the public some sense of the scale of this. We're, we're the smallest county in California, except for San Francisco. And when I look at these uh, reports on the funding that we're receiving, sometimes we're getting a fifth of the money that's available in the state um, out of a particular grant or program or something. And that, that you can't take that for granted. And it's just very, very impressive that our staff work again, for the reasons Andy laid, laid out and others. Um, I, I think it's, we've also been successful because 
we're looking at things in a multimodal way. And I think the state has shifted to that approach. And that we, I think we exemplify that way of looking at these projects. So I mean, we, we've just done extraordinarily well to get a sense of that. Again, you think 58 counties and we're the smallest one in terms of uh, physical area. And, and we're, we're taking a fifth of the money in the state on a bunch of these, these things. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Rockin. <laughs> um, all right, any other comments or questions from commissioners? Being now, I'll open it to the public. And the chair recognizes Mr. Peoples. Hi, again, I'll turn off my um, sound one. Hey, hey so, uh, yeah, great job, Rachel, on the success you're doing on getting the awards. Uh, phenomenal Measure D obviously has helped with that. We support it, Measure D. You know, the other thing to realize is they're realistic projects, right? Realistic projects, electric buses, rubber wheels on asphalt using the existing infrastructure. Uh, highway one widening, that is critical and using the infrastructure that's there with buses. That's the type of, of uh, projects that are granted, that are awarded by the, the, the government agencies because they look at it, say, how realistic is this project? It doesn't violate things like the Coastal Commission requirements where you may have a transit corridor runs 20 feet from the ocean. So really want to encourage us to keep looking at projects that are realistic, that we can accomplish, that we won't destroy um, ecological systems. Um, so again, Rachel, good work. Uh, looking really great that we're winning so much grant money. I'm very excited to see how we move forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. But I see no one else on Zoom or here in chamber, so I'll return it to the commission for action. Move the staff recommendation. Second. Motion by Commissioner Schifrin, second by Commissioner McPherson uh, to move the staff recommendation to adopt the uh, 2020, or 2023 state and federal legislative programs. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Montesino. Aye. Commissioner Hernandez. Aye. Commission Alternate Schifrin. Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn. Yes. Commission Alternate Pigler. Aye. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner McPherson. Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Aye. Commissioner Rotkin. Aye. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. The 2023 state and federal legislative programs being adopted. We will now proceed uh, with the commission will move into closed session. And uh, council, are there any items that will be reportable from closed session? Uh, we are not anticipating reportable items given the uh, follow on item on the open session. All right. Thank you. And do you um, have any sense of how long we'll need for closed session? I would estimate not more than 10 minutes. Okay, um, well, let's take a five minute break move then so that we can transfer over to closed session for commissioners uh, and then initial. Manu, minutes. Ask, the, ask the public if they have any comments on the closed session item first. All right, is there anyone here in, in uh, any public members that have comments or questions? All right, uh, seeing none here in chambers or online, Commissioner Quinn. Uh, uh, Manu, can we resend the closed session link? I hate to say it, but it may take me 10 minutes to log into the closed session. And if it's only 10 minutes, so if it could be resend, that would be great. Uh, the clerk can work with Community TV to send the closed session link. That'd be great. Or even put it in the chat. Or, right. Well, as long as it's not a public link. Um, all right, so we'll uh, take a five minute break as the commission reconvening closed session at, well, let's just say 1030 and then anticipate that to take about 10 minutes. So the uh, commission should be back in public session to hear item 30, uh, 29 and, and uh, 30 at about 1040. Thank you. Regular agenda of the Regional Transportation Commission. Uh, item 29, was there any reportable action out of closed session? There was no reportable uh, item from closed session. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All 
All right, thank you, Council. Then we'll proceed with item 30, which is approval of purchase and sale agreement for acquisition of 7994 and 7996 SoCal Drive for Highway 1 auxiliary lanes and bus on shoulder from State Park Drive to Freedom Boulevard and Coastal Rail Trail Segment 12 project. Senior Transportation Engineer, Sarah Christensen. Thank you, Chair Koenig. Um, my name is Sarah Christensen of your staff. I'm here today to recommend approval of a purchase and sale agreement for the acquisition of 7994 and 7996 SoCal Drive. Um, I'm going to read the staff recommendation. Um, there's an attached resolution um, that details all of the approvals here. So approving and accepting the term terms and conditions of purchase and sale agreement attached to real property uh, located at 7994 and 7996 SoCal Drive in Aptos, accessor uh, parcel number 0392302 and 01, authorizing the executive director to execute the purchase and sale agreement uh, to complete the feasibility studies required to uh, waive the contingency set forth in the purchase and sale agreement to make payment on the real property acquisition and related escrow fees pursuant to the purchase and sale agreement, authorizing the close of escrow, authorizing the chair of the commission to execute the certificate of acceptance for the associated deed and escrow documents, amending the Measure D active transportation five-year program of projects to shift $2 million uh, forward to the current fiscal year that were previously programmed in a future fiscal year um, for this purchase, amending the RTC budget in the current fiscal year accordingly, and then authorizing a short-term interprogram loan from the Measure D highway category to the Measure D active transportation category if needed to manage cash flow in the current fiscal year. And that's going to depend on um, the actual uh, expenditures this fiscal year. So I'm going to talk generally about the project. So the project is along Highway 1. Uh, there's bus on shoulder and auxiliary lanes proposed between the State Park Drive interchange and the Freedom Boulevard interchange. The project also includes segment 12 of the Coastal Rail Trail. The um, trail is uh, proposed on the inland side of the tracks. There's currently one alternative. Um, the reason for that is the placement of the trail on the inland side of the tracks was the least impactful to right of way and the environment. And then uh, at January 12th, commission approved the purchase and sale agreement for the adjacent parcel 7992 SoCal Drive. The, uh, there was a property that went on the market um, at 7992 SoCal Drive and through the conversations with the seller broker, um, he also represents the next door. You got muted suddenly. Sarah, you got muted. She can't hear me probably. We got rid of the echo and then some. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People in the room can probably hear her, but we can't. Yeah. Is anybody else? They listening? can't hear us. Nobody yeah. can hear us. Yeah. I don't yeah. think this is her way. Talk about silos. She's back. She's back. She's back. Okay. She's back. okay. There we go. Okay. Apologies. Okay, so the project has an EIR that's going to be circulated uh, this month, and we anticipate CEQA being completed later this year. Um, protection acquisition prevents properties needed for future transportation projects from being acquired and developed by private developers. And staff is pursuing uh, Caltrans approval for the protection acquisition. Staff recommends accepting and approving uh, the purchase and sale agreement and acquiring this property and um, just some fiscal impacts. Uh, the programming for the project uh, right of way capital is out in fiscal year 2025 and staff recommends reprogramming that measure D in the current fiscal year, which may require an interprogram loan to manage the cash flow of measure D depending on actual expenditures in this fiscal year. That concludes my presentation. I'm available for questions. 
Thank you, Senior Engineer Christensen. Are there comments or questions from members of the commission? Seeing none here in chambers, none online, then I'll open it up to the public. Any member of the public wish to comment on this item? All right, not seeing one here in chambers or online. So I'll return it to the commission for action. Commissioner Rockin. I'll move the staff recommendation and I want to make a brief comment if it gets seconded, I assume it will. Second. So my, my comment, um, um, there have been a number of comments in the media, uh, letters to the editor of the Sentinel, comments from our uh, the public in our meeting, I'll give this echo again, uh, the, um, that the auxiliary lane project is not going to deliver very much in the way of um, improvements to traffic on Highway 1. I, I tend to share that view, but I know that there's huge divisions among the public about this. Other people think it's going to make a big difference, or even if it's a small difference, they'd be willing to pay a fortune to make it happen. And in 2016, we put together a spending package in Measure D that included these auxiliary lanes. And um, so the public, I think, when they voted on Measure D, had every reason to expect that we were going to build these auxiliary lanes. My objections, not 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 the material. And so I just want to make clear that I, I continue to support all these various decisions we're making about the auxiliary lanes because I think a higher priority than uh, the particular issue of this or that. When you tell the public we're taking your taxes for something and this is what we're going to spend it on and this is how it's going to going to go, that you need to follow through on that. The worst thing you could do is. You know, again, just because we, we all, if all of a sudden we woke up and six of us thought the auxiliary lanes didn't make a lot of sense, I think it'd be a betrayal of the public trust to, at this point to to abandon this project, even if we individually think it's not going to make a huge amount of difference. I don't think it's going to be terrible. I think it'll make some improvements. I think they're maybe not as great as some people expect they're going to be. But I'm going to continue to support this for that reason. I think you have, we have a responsibility to respond to what the public thought they were voting for. Um, and th that's the reason, though, although I have my doubts. So every meeting we hear from a number of people that think that this auxiliary lane project's not going to do much, it's not going to make a difference. And I, I hear those comments. I don't disagree even with those comments, but I, I don't think they're very helpful to me because I'm going to continue to support what we told the public we're going to spend measure D funds on and, and, and do everything we could do to get leverage additional funds from the state feds and everybody else to make the project happen. And we'll see what happens with it. And, uh, I may be proven right in the end that it wasn't a great project, but I, at this point, I, I reserve the right to say that when it happens, but I'm not going to uh, do anything to prohibit these projects from moving forward. So that's my motion on this, the reason I have the motion on this item. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rockin. Commissioner Quinn. You know, I, I'm listening to Commissioner Rockin's comments, um, and, and I agree, but it does raise a question, you know, maybe for another time. Uh, does the commission lead or follow the public? And when we commit to a decision and subsequent data comes in, what data would change our mind? And, and I think those are important questions that we should keep in front of us. I, I agree with that totally, Robert. And I think if we, if, if it were an absolute factual question of what's going to happen, I might at some point be willing to undo something I'd said earlier in public or what the public had asked us for. But I think there's enough controversy about what the Event, results are going to be that at this point to substitute my judgment for that of the voters would be a mistake. And that, that's what I'm trying to say here. It's not that I would never uh, change my mind when new facts come in and, and uh, make clear that something we're doing is, is stupid or doesn't, it's a waste of public money and so forth. We're not quite at that point, I don't think, on this project. Agreed. And, and Rotkin. We do have a motion by Commissioner Rotkin and second by Commissioner Schifrin to approve the purchase and sale agreement for acquisition of 7994 and 7996 and uh, authorize the executive director um, with uh, associated uh, to, to, to perform associated actions. Is there any further discussion? Okay. Um, I think we I think we did. I did call for public comment once. I see a member of the public wishes to comment now. I'll take that comment at this time. And any other member of the public that missed the first opportunity? Thank you, Chairman Koenig. Um, this is David in La Salva Beach. Uh, there's an echo happening in the room. Could you mute the. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so just to clarify, induced demand isn't saying that traffic, there's no benefit to traffic or it gets worse. It's all it's saying is that if something's easier, people will do it more often. 
So by widening Highway 1, we're actually improving the flow of traffic. The fear is, is that more people will then occupy, occupy that lane because there's a market decision that's easier to get into town. Um, so by objecting to widening, all you're saying is that we need to maintain or worsen the level of congestion to discourage people from traveling in our own communities. I really think that's an important position. So I, I'm in total support of this and thank you so much for your work on it. I think we've been separated out from the discussion again. All right, I think we're all back. So we have a motion by Commissioner Rod, a second by Commissioner Schiffer. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Commissioner Montesino? Aye. Commissioner Hernandez? Yes. An alternate Schiffer? Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commission Alternate Pegler? Aye. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. That passes unanimously. The commission or so the purchase and sale agreement is approved. All right. We will that brings us to the end of our agenda for today. The next Regular meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission will be, according to our old Brown Act rules, uh, Thursday, March 2nd, 2023 at 9 a.m. here at the County Board of Supervisors Chambers at 701 Ocean Street, room 525. And I also have a note that for a transportation policy workshop scheduled for Thursday, February 16th, before the next regular meeting, uh, 2023 at 9 a.m. by Zoom teleconference, do we have no Director Preston, if we anticipate having that meeting. That has been canceled. Okay, that is officially canceled. So we'll see you next month, March 2nd, here at the Board of Supervisors Chambers. Meeting adjourned.